Google Lab is easy. And the new homework, I think it's uh, easier than the homework three, but it does require notions of statistical estimation, so maybe that's harder for some students. Um, what we did last class was simulating random variables, and the, this, the homework relative to this set of notes will be assigned this weekend, so you will have a, a few things due at the same time if you want to get a head start on it. Okay. So recall that simulating random variables is important because you might want to check um, the empirical results of maybe a hypothesis testing procedure, or you might want to see that some statistical model actually matches um, what you would expect from simulation. You can also estimate models. That's a little bit out of the scope of this course, but uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo or Monte Carlo techniques is the, the buzzword that would be related to that. So the basis material for simulating a statistical model is simulating a random variable. That's, you have to start somewhere. So recall that we have these um, two cases. The first case is common distributions. That has both discrete and continuous distributions in them in that first bullet, but obviously as a prerequisite for this course, you should have seen maybe what a binomial is, what a, what a gamma is, et cetera. So R has all of the built-in functions um, to do common distributions. And then we have uncommon distributions. And the simple case of an uncommon distribution is the discrete case, because it just uses the sample function, right? So the sample function allows you to just put weights in as your corresponding discrete probabilities and sample from a vector, okay? Um, where we're at right now is continuous random variables, and this requires a little bit more um, statistics, I guess you would say. This is one of the more theoretical lectures in this class, which is not very bad, but we do a little bit of calculus. Couple reminders. For common distributions, um, there's four different letters that are, that are going to show up in front of the common functions. Okay, so whatever the distribution is, let's say it's a binomial, right? You'll do either d binom, p binom, q binom, or r binom. Okay, let's say it's a an exponential distribution. It would be d exp, p exp, q exp, or r exp. Does that make sense? So d gives you the density, um, but it also gives you the mass function. So recall that when you stick a value into a mass function, it is the probability, but when you stick a value into the density function, it's only the height of the density function. Okay? It's not a probability. Okay. The cumulative probability, CDF, is all the area up to a point, if it's a density, and it's the sum up to a point if it's discrete, if it's a mass function, okay? Q, the quantile function, that's the inverse of the CDF, that's how you find critical values or quantiles of a distribution. And the most relevant one for today is actually random number simulation. Um, that's so R, whatever the distribution is, that simulates random numbers. So, let me get a few examples. Note that these are the common ones. There's a few more that R has. I just didn't list them. But um, serve as a reference. These are the distributions. Okay. All right. And then we started the uncommon distribution section. Um, this is such an easy first bullet to use the sample function that we covered this briefly. And recall, when you use the sample function, you start with a vector. Obviously, this showed up in the bootstrap procedure, or you know, if you want to simulate rolling a die, whatever the case might be. Um, it always defaults replace equals false. So I know I repeat myself, but you'll exhaust the list if you don't replace it. So you need to replace equals true if you're going to simulate a random variable. And if you want to have unequal probabilities, then you'll change the probability vector to have certain probabilities for each value. Okay? Let's start another one. Right. 
size. Size is the number of trials, yeah. So if you want a thousand draws from some discrete distribution. Okay. And a simple example um, for an uncommon distribution. What should you be getting out of this? You, you put the exact probabilities in, since you know the true discrete random variables probability to the mass function. Um, you apply the sample function with the support. So this is the, the support of the random variables one to three. Does that make sense, the vocabulary? And here we're, we're choosing a thousand cases. We look at the head of this. Everything looks correct because we're getting more threes than other values, which seems reasonable since it has the highest weight associated with that value. And if you look at the empirical um, probability mass function, then you see that one occurs almost 10%, uh, two occurs almost 20%, three occurs almost 70%. These three have to add up to one. The, the theoretical probability is obviously added. All right, so now let's get to the uncommon random variables, okay? so let's. Let's think of this. Let's say you're doing an experiment and you collect data, but your histogram produces some PDF that looks like something you're not used to. Does that make sense? This is a we don't this is a whatever distribution. Okay. It has a probability density function f of x. You're more likely to draw cases in this area, right? But it has like three modes, whatever. Point being, how do we do this? Okay. Well, first of all, um, we're going to do the inverse transform method, and um, it may not work for certain situations like this, because so we have to have an invertible CDF. And let's let's go over this. So here's the theorem. If you took inference, um, you we proved this in class. We also did an assignment. We did a couple problems related to this. If x is a continuous random variable with CDF capital F. Then f of capital X is distributed uniform. Does that make any sense? This is a very subtle theorem. Okay. So remember, in statistics, capital means it's random variable, right? So random variable. So f of lowercase x, this is the probability density function, right? Capital F of lowercase x is the CDF, which by definition is the integral from negative infinity to x of f of t dt, right? So this is where it's confusing. This is not a random variable. This is a function. So the, the quantity capital F of capital X is a random variable. So this is, is a random variable. So what this means is we're taking random draws from X and sticking them into the actual CDF. And it turns out, if you think of this as a new random variable, let's say Y, then Y Uniform. <coughs> Zero one. And this should make sense because if you let me draw another picture. If you have what does a CDF look like if it's continuous? Always? Kind of the sig sigmoidal. Does that make sense? It always has the shape. This is one. This is zero. So it's always gonna have this shape. Does that make sense? So if we take random draws from x, that means they're going to be on the x-axis, right? I don't know where the highest density, it depends on the steepness of the CDF, that's where the highest density occurs, right? So then you map all of these up to the function, and then they're going to be on the unit interval, right? So this, if you plot a histogram of all the values, after plugging them into f of x, 
then this histogram is going to look uniform. Does that make any sense? The original histogram might look like a Gaussian or something, or a gamma. But when you plug them into to a CDF, this will look uniform. Okay? So, yeah, like, like, so imagine the random draws. Like, you have some density governing the random draws. So it's a little misleading for me to put a bunch of dashes here. But maybe the original density actually looks like this. Okay? So you're more likely to draw cases right here because that's where most of the mass is, right? But then the steepness of f, which comes from the integral of the density function, actually distributes the input of the random draws into f uniformly on the vertical axis. So it's kind of confusing. If that's uh, uniform, then the derivative of f of x should be constant. Um, if this is uniform, yes. then the CDF is, yeah, it's the identity function. That makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. Change, the change is a constant. Yeah, exactly. So when you don't have a uniform case, the rate of change is governed by the cumulative area, and hence it, that accounts for the non-uniform x. Okay. Does that make sense? But it's a really easy picture if it's uniform, because then it's the identity function. And then obviously, if you distribute uniform values, they're going to be uniform. It's the exact same, yeah. right? So, yeah. So that's a uniform case. This is just some case. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, anyway. Um, what you have to understand from this section is that you just have to follow an algorithm, essentially. So here's the proof, which is really cool, by the way. So first of all, you have to assume that uh, that f is invertible, okay? It's hence the inverse transform theorem. So you you generate a u from the unit interval, and then uh, y equals f inverse of u is a realization from f. That's the whole. That's how the theorem works, okay? So it shouldn't be a big surprise from the first theorem statement. And the reason why this works is because. If you start with your random variable, you're pretty much just writing down exactly what's on the, on the slides. But, okay, here's a uniform random variable, right? Let's say it's uh, over zero to one, right? Let's call this random variable u, or whatever, we'll use, let's use u. So what is the, what is the probability density function of this? Over zero to one, zero otherwise. So what's the CDF of you? It's just you. Does that make sense? It's the antiderivative of technically it's zero, right? Um, for that, I'll just write you. Okay. So what this means is if I let y equal the random variable let's just kind of reverse engineer this. Um, I'm trying to be, I don't want to miss, I don't want to put too many symbols in here using x. But if you think of the random variable x, right? Then what this means is that if you take the inverse, f inverse y, that's x. Does that make sense? But what is y? Y is u. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the whole notion. So, so how do you derive the actual probability density function of a transformation? This is always the same. If you take a probability theory course, you always wonder, what's the probability of y less than or equal to y? You substitute the quantity directly in. I'm mixing x and y, so sorry about that. I don't mean to confuse. Um, but you substitute the quantity directly in. And then, if you evaluate f of each side, the inverse cancels the argument, and you're left with just u. And then, here's the step 
from here to here that's a little subtle. But why can I say that p of u less than f of y is equal to f of y? Because it's the CDF of a uniform. Because it's the identity function, right? The CDF of a uniform, you just evaluate f of y, it is f of y. Does that make sense? That's this right here. Okay. So that's it. Okay. All right, anyway, the, the application is a little bit more important. So here's the inverse transform algorithm. Um, so what you do is first actually derive the inverse of f. That's an analytic problem. You just get a piece of paper and do the inverse, right? Um, to do this, go back to college algebra, and figure out how to do an inverse of a function. Does that make sense? So typically, you switch the variables and you solve the other variable. That's like the easiest way to do it. Okay. Um, write a function to compute let's say the value x, which is f inverse of u. And then for each realization, generate a random value u. That's easy. We have a uniform function, right? So think, like, let's reinvent the wheel. In theory, you could use that linear congruential operator, generate a number from the unit interval, and stick it into the inverse, and then you can get any distribution you want. Does that make sense? You can literally simulate random draws for probability distributions for a number, right? Pretty cool. Um, and then you just, once you evaluate the uniform, you just stick it in to F inverse. That's it. And that is part of the uniform random algorithm where you we can pretty much generate any random variable. Um, assuming that you can invert the, the CDF. Any continuous CDF is going to have that form, but they often don't have that nice, like a nice analytic inverse. <laughs> you know what I mean? um, so what you really are doing is you're generating this from here, and you're just doing the inverse, and it's mapping. That's all it's going to be. Which CDF is not equal to that? Well, you can, for example, uh, I guess you'll see it. Like, Just like an, an inverse of a function, you can't, sometimes it doesn't have an inverse, right? If you think about it, it crosses two points, like a quadratic, for example. Does that make sense? It is increasing. I don't think it has a problem. CDF. That's true. Like that, an inverse will exist. It just might not exist post form. Oh. Do you see what I mean? So like, you can't solve it analytically. So, so let's do a nice example. This is a pretty famous example. You can see this in other stats courses. So let's simulate an exponential random variable or exponential random variables with lambda equals two. Recall there's a rate parameter and there's also a scale parameter for exponential. I don't know how you were taught. Um, there's two ways to parameterize an exponential. One of them is lambda e to the negative lambda x, right? Or x greater than zero. The other way is one over beta e to the negative one over beta x for beta greater than zero. Um, I bet for x greater than zero. Both of them have to have a parameter greater than zero. What's the mean of the first one? What's the mean of the second one? This, this has a convenient parameterization because the mean is beta. This obviously is the inverse of beta. Okay. Is the rate. The reason I like this one better is because it connects to the Poisson process. Okay? So the number of arrivals of customers, you can connect that to an exponential distribution. It's the same lambda, right? Anyway, we're going to use the top. <laughs> That's what I'm getting at here. So here's our function, star. Okay? So first we have to find the CDF. So how do you find the CDF? Capital F of X. You integrate this guy from negative infinity, right, to X. Lambda E to the negative X, lambda X. Yes. So let's use T. Let's use a different one. So what is that? Easy calculus and substitution. So one 
minus e to the negative lambda. So that's the closed form CDF of the exponential distribution. So what do we do next? I'm going to have this on the slide, so it's just nice to do this thing. We want to find the inverse, right? So if we call this thing, let's say y equals, or call it f, whatever you want, doesn't matter. It's 1 minus e to the negative lambda x, right? How do you solve for the inverse? You switch them, right? Does that make sense? This, I feel like this is like a college algebra level computation. Maybe I'll let this be y just to help. So then you move this over, right? E to the negative lambda y equals 1 minus x. Take the log of each side, right? Negative lambda y equals log base e of 1 minus x, and then f inverse of x. I'll just switch y with that now. It was just for ease of symbols. Like I just arbitrarily switched f inverse with y. Does that make sense? Um, it's what? Negative 1 over lambda log 1 minus x. So what this means is if you simulate uniforms and you stick it in this function, that will be an exponential random okay. Does that make any sense? So what does realization mean? Realization is a word referring to a random draw. Uh, so it's like, when I say one realized uniform, it's like we picked one uniform out of the distribution. So it's commonly used in random simulation. Yeah. So would, would we be expected to be able to replicate something like this on an exam? Yes. You should be able to find a, an inverse of a simple one and then program this. Okay. So, Here's all the work. Uh, you could have looked ahead in the slides. Um, if you're rusty on the CDF computation, eh, it's not that bad. I don't know. If they study, study how to find a CDF. <laughs> okay. Um, they skipped all the steps there. I don't mean to mix up the symbols. I'm not trying to confuse. It's just, the, it's just college algebra stuff. So. Um, so here is the actual code. And this is really easy. Notice, um, we can. This is vectorized as well, right? We don't have to write a loop. Does that make sense? Because f inverse, you stick in u and lambda. You can default lambda to be something if you wanted to, um, and it's just going to return zero if you're out of the. Notice you can only plug certain things into that log. Does that make sense? Well, I guess this is kind of silly anyway. If you're only sticking in values from 0 to 1, you don't really need this conditional statement. You're never going to, it's not possible to get a 1 or a 0 or a negative value or something above 1 if you generate from a uniform in R, right? But this will guarantee, just in case um, you're using a different type of simulation function. So then you output 0 if it's not going to be defined in the support of the uniform, and then Otherwise, you output the, uh, the simulated inverse. Okay. So everybody should know what an exponential distribution looks like. So let's compute um, a bunch of u values first. Stick them into store the u values into x. U's are uniforms. Does that make sense? And let's plot this. So the histogram, this is subtle. Um, if you use frequency as the histogram, then it's the height of the you know, simulated number of cases. But you have to use probability equals true, otherwise it's not going to be scaled correctly. Does that make sense? Because think about a histogram, it's, it's the counts, right? 
a density function has to integrate to one, so it can't be very tall, just inherently. So what this represents is the actual histogram, and what this represents is the true density overlaid on the histogram to make sure everything is working out correctly. Okay. So at this moment, please ask questions. Going on. Is there anything that helps clarify? So, just one more question, please. So, in the, in the first place, you, you mentioned something like uh, y equals to f minus u is a realization of f. So, that, that, does it mean that y is, is a random draw from, from, the, from the distribution covered by C and f? Yes, so statisticians are often lazy. They'll say it comes from f or x or lowercase f. It, it's, all, it's all the same. Uh, and I mean, basically, any continuous random variable, no matter it's common or uncommon, uh, is uh, the transform of fx, f taken x, f right. is uniformly, standard uniformly distributed. Yes, if it's continuous. Uh, and then based on this theorem, we, we just try to uh, have build the inverse transform algorithm. Yep. It does have any kind of uniform random variable, and of that, uh, plug it back into inverse capital F, inverse CDF, and get whatever, whatever, you know, whatever, then y or x. That is correct. Yeah, I think, and, and, and I think, I think all we need is just the CDF, the given CDF, and we need to find the inverse. Yes, yes. And just hope that you can convert it, right? Yeah, yeah. Hope like, Because, like, think of an inverse of a normal distribution. It doesn't, it's in terms of an interval, it's not closed form. Does that make sense? I mean, you could do it numerically, but you couldn't, uh, you couldn't just find a closed form inverse. So this works better than uh, the normal is because it's the so phi of z. Let's use the standard uh, normal distribution. It's the integral from negative infinity to z of one over square root of pi dx p um, negative one over two t squared dt. So there's not a closed form anti-derivative of this. Unless you, you can, if you stick positive infinity in here, you can actually do the antiderivative. Or if you stick zero in here, you can exploit symmetry and do the antiderivative. You can use like polar coordinates. You can, skip, you can get the solution. But if you just stick an arbitrary value of z, this has to be done numerically. And that's why they have z tables. So, does that make sense? So you couldn't do negative infinity to zero to z. Um, zero to z would cause us the same issues. Because right. it's, it's those, it's those special numbers that we can compute these values. So, does that make sense? But yeah, it's, so obviously several probability densities are not going to have a nice close form inverse. This method is limited, but it's still capable. I think basically, in order to find an inverse function, you just try to, you know, if originally we express y in terms of x, and then we will try to express x in terms of y. Yeah, that's, so that's unfortunately I'm teaching it like a low level algebra type way of doing it, but I know that it's been a while for some students. So. Yeah. It's exactly how you were taught in first functions a long time ago. So. Okay, so again, the true density, we knew what it was, um, although we have exponential is a common density, let's just assume that it's not. So more frequent values should be closer to zero. And if this really was the truth, the histogram should follow the true density, and it does. Does that make sense? You can refine the breaks a little bit more. It might be a little bit better. So let's do a task now. Let's see if you guys can do this. This is a very simple function. I'll tell you what, just for the students who haven't had calculus, um, Let's do the first part really quickly. Okay. So this is the actual PDF, right? So f of x is 3x squared. Okay. So the PDF, and it's over uh, 0 to 1, right? So obviously it looks like this, right? So when you create it, if you were to simulate data from this, Better look something like 
that's the whole goal is to simulate data that looks like that. Um, so what is the CDF? So by the power rule, I'll write this out in a couple of steps. The support starts at what value? Zero, right? Yeah. So you technically negative infinity to zero is zero. So I'll just skip all that. So this is zero to One. some value x, right? Three t squared dt, which is equal to what? X cubed. Thank you. Nice invertible form. <laughs> Right. So what's the inverse? What's f inverse? X to the one. How did I get from here to here? You switch the variables, take the one third power of each side. Does that make sense? It's just classic. So this should be in the scope of this class, um, going from knowing what this is to this to this. Okay. And is that like the intensity that we'll be like we would be asked that, or or would we, what, what I'm yeah, trying to say is I, would, I mean I think the other one was fair. Oh yeah no no so yeah. I'm saying but that's kind of like we're not going to be asked for some. So we're not going to be tested on identifying whether we can actually integrate it properly to make it work. Like creating a, it, it should be somewhat obvious. Like, okay. okay. Yeah. Like um. Yeah. It's likely going to be a power function or okay some exponential that has an inverse. You know what I mean? It's it's got to be something. Or you know, what's a famous one is the Cauchy distribution. Okay. Because that's a, of course, that integral it's an arc tangent. I don't know. Maybe you remember. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, that's been a while. Okay. Yeah. So count two. Um. Anyway. Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So then. <laughs> Here's the task itself. I know I just solved this task for you guys. But you start with um, the function. We have the inverse, right? Pretty much there's no steps to show computing the inverse. It's, this is such an easy exercise. So define a function f inverse. It's literally the function return u to the 1 third. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter if you use u or x. I'm just using u because we're going to stick u's in there. But Remember that it's a local environment, it doesn't matter, it's not going to be negatively impacted by using different letters. And then you simulate, let's say, 1,000 uniform draws, stick it into the function, f inverse, we'll store that as x. And if everything worked out, then the true probability density function, which is not common, it actually is a common one. You know what that is? I'm just I just have to figure out. It seems like a very simple. What's something recognize it? It's actually a beta. <laughs> beta distributions get all sorts of shapes over the unit interval. A, a standard uniform is actually a beta as well. But anyway. So because the exponent is like the coefficient minus one or something. Yeah. So just for fun, it's. So the beta distribution is B, this is the beta normalizing constant of alpha beta times x to the alpha minus 1 times 1 minus x to the beta minus 1. And this is over the unit interval. So this will integrate to 1 with the, with the appropriate normalizing constant. Um, so if you choose beta to equal 1, right, and alpha to equal what? Well, it's, it, this is going to have to be a 3 for it to So in turn, if you go on R and you compute beta of 3, comma, oh, right. 1, that's going to actually be, it has to be 3 for it. Yeah. That I, got this. I have a question about sure. the, that last function that you integrated, the lambda e to the negative lambda t. Can you show how you evaluated that at negative Sure. Okay, so we integrated um, negative infinity to x lambda e to the negative lambda x dx. So when it's an improper integral, you pull the limit outside. So it's the limit is, let's say, I need another letter here, about L. Now that's too many L's. Um, 
W goes to infinity of W X, right? So in an improper integral, you have to evaluate it as a finite integral and then evaluate the limit. Um, so that's lambda E to the negative lambda X. I'm going to use the T here, my bad. It doesn't really matter. You can see the result. So keep the limit there. W goes to infinity. Then the antiderivative of this is um, negative e to the negative lambda, in this case t, and you evaluate this from w to x. Does that make sense? So then when you evaluate this, it's the limit as w goes to infinity. Oh. Is that W is negative? Yes, thank you. So that's negative E to the negative lambda x plus, because it's minus a negative, um, E to the negative lambda W. And this is constant in terms of W. So the limit of this is just going to be the same quantity. But what's the limit of this? As w goes to positive, to negative. Did I do something wrong? This is just Negative infinity. Change the limits. You could, or you could make this uh, positive infinity. Make that. Negative. But yeah, I mean, I worked out the same thing you have, and that's why I was getting the e to the infinity. That I don't mean to waste too much time, but okay. Somebody catches my mistake. Please interrupt. Really stupid, I know. It's just like so obvious. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, this is like such a common interval. I'm just having a moment. Um, So, so now let's go over the accept reject algorithm. And this um, this is a little different, but it's actually a, it's gonna work for any CDF. You don't have to worry about the in, if it's invertible or not. If, if it's invertible, you can still use the accept reject algorithm. Okay? So this actually is more general. Um, Commonly accepted. It's just, I think, for teaching reasons, it's fun to do the uh, inverse CDF. Okay. So, we've seen that uh, generating random variables from a PDF is easy if it's standard distribution or if we have a nice invertible CDF. What can we do if all we've got is the PDF and we can't invert the CDF? We can compute it, um, kind of like the normal distribution. So rejection sampling obtains draws exactly from the target distribution. The way it performs this task is by sampling candidates from an easier distribution than correcting the sampling probability by randomly rejecting some candidates. That makes sense. 
So it'll make more sense to see. Say if the CDF can ever be not invertible? Yeah, like we said, it always is. Technically, it's, it always is invertible in the definition of a function. Because if you look at the form of a CDF, it's always going to look like this for continuous distributions. Right. But the problem is, it, you might have to do it numerically so, uh, with like, a, like an inverse sulfur. Uh, so then it kind of contradicts the whole purpose. Might as well just do a uh, reject except out um, of So suppose the PDF of F is a zero outside the interval C D and it's less than or equal to M on the interval. So let's let's just say our PDF looks like this, okay? Now this is arbitrary going from zero to one. It seems to be a theme of the lecture, whatever, okay? But point being, you can bound this probability density function in a window. That's the whole point, okay? And what we want to effectively do is accept values that fall under the curve and keep those as being the true x values. So here's the way it works. Let's, this, is a, this isn't the formal algorithm, but this kind of motivates it. Let's assume that we picked a bunch of uniforms over the, both the x and the y scale. Does that make sense? So let's say you're just throwing darts at this grid, and you have no aim, and you're just uniformly hitting everywhere, OK? Then what you're going to see is that you have several cases that fall under the curve and the cases that fall outside the curve, obviously, right? So we want to devise some kind of algorithm that only keeps the x values that essentially fall under the curve. That's, that would mean that it comes from the target distribution. Um, one thing to note is that this is a beta. I know, see, like, for teaching reasons, students often complain, why would you tell us how to simulate a beta when we know how to simulate it? It's just more, in principle, you can do it. Right? Does that make sense? So, you can't really find the inverse of some certain beta distributions. All right. So, what we can see here is that the mean of the selected values, notice how we selected them by the ones that fell under the, the beta density. The mean is about, uh, or the proportion of values that fell under the curve is about 0.4167. Is the deviance function a D beta is a built in R function for simulating the common beta distribution. Yeah. So it's hard, if you don't have like stats background, it's hard to know like what's the beta distribution. It's just another common distribution. So, yeah. <laughs> but yes, it's an R function. What the D beta does is it traces the shape back. So what's the point to, to, to hit everywhere, uniformly everywhere? Because, so the whole point, the whole theme of this last two set of slides is we can always generate from the unit interval yeah. by a linear congruential operator, mm -hmm. or just use R unit and R, and then there should be some kind of algorithm where if you generate from uniforms, you should be able to generate from any probability distribution. It's like the basis of in this case, the white, red dots and black dots, what, what, what do they stand for? Do they have any meaning? The red dots and the black dots yeah. specifically mean that they're either above or under the curve. So we, we, we are above the curve, so why? Um, so essentially what we want to do is we want to we want to store all of the red the x values of the red dots mm -hmm. that fell, or the x values of the dots that are red. And that would imply that they come from a, a, a beta distribution. Oh, that is a beta, a beta PDF. Yes, this is the actual beta PDF. But if you, so let's say you simulate, um, you know, these 300 ordered pairs and only keep the x values that fall such that the y values are under the beta, that's their accept reject algorithm. But we're going to formalize this in like a, an actual algorithm, but that's the, this is the whole basis notion of it. Does that store x values that will, that will to some degree represent, um, represent the actual PDF curve? Yes. Because, we also, yes. because there are lots of dots with, with x values between 0.2 or 0.4. Yeah, like notice that every x value satisfies 0 to 1. But we're only going to keep the x values such that the y values. 
or less than, than the beta term. And we have to devise a, some kind of algorithm to accomplish that task. Yeah, that would be less shameful for us. Yep. That makes sense. Okay. Because you have more values in this region than this region, right? So it makes sense that when you construct the histogram of the x's, it would look like this. Okay, so to further um, validate this notion, this isn't the proof per se, but if you look at the proportion of sample points that are less than 0.5, specifically of the accepted points, it's about 0.856, but if you compute the true beta probability, it's about 0.856. So this, is, this should convince you that if you keep the ones that we accept, from being under the beta, that this really are, these are really the true betas, which is pretty interesting. Does that make sense? This is, I know this is tricky. Yeah. Okay. So, for this to work efficiently, um, we have to cover the target distribution with one that sits close to it. So obviously if you simulated with a huge rectangle and that beta was very a very small part of the simulation, then uh, it's not gonna work as well. So in this case, we'll simulate a bunch of uniform ordered pairs. And it looks like the, we're going over zero, what's the difference here? Does somebody, can somebody tell me? What's the difference between this simulation going from 0 to 2.6, right, in the y's. But in this one, I'm going from 0 to 10. Point being, you're not getting like a, like the perfect, if you could perfectly cover the beta, then it would be extremely efficient. Does that make sense? So what we're doing in the second picture, this is 0 to 10 now, and that beta, So when we simulate random points everywhere, the proportion that fall under is not really representative of the beta. So ideally what we want to do is try to get our envelope, so to speak, to be really close to beta. Okay. And that's 1.6. Um, 1.6 is the is the word. Okay. It's like just getting as close to the beta. So it's technically like the opt like the, the ideal thing to do is to just find where the maximum is and then just put a uniform on top of that. Uh, in that case, if 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 we said that maximum to be very high, yeah. Then only of course only only a few points fall fall on the curve. That's the whole that's yeah, that's exactly why it's about sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So here's a picture of, I don't know, it's just a solar picture, uh, illustrating the same concept. This time, the window is much bigger. So well, here's the white dots. The white dots are just the places where it was not actually um, simulated. Oh. So, uh, it, we just uh, created a graph. I'm just showing you the picture. It's totally fine. This isn't necessarily relevant to, it's just a higher window than the other one. Is the height of the, of the beta curve different at different points? Because it looks like it goes up by 2.5 or something, but then previously uniformly went up to 1.6. Oh, uh, this, this has the same thing. Oh, 2.6, not 1.6. I was confused. Yeah. My bad, that makes more sense. So before I move on, I guess what I'm trying to get for everyone to see is you, if you don't understand probability theory, then that's too bad, but can you accept the fact, <laughs> can you accept the fact that you're accepting the x values that are under that curve? That's what you need to be accepting. Yes. Okay? So, and it's some, at least you don't really don't need to know the common ones because it's for uncommon. It's fine. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So now we need to somehow formalize that. How do we accept values that are under the curve? Also, how do we make the, the window small enough that it, it captures um, the truth in an efficient manner? So here's the we accept reject algorithm. So suppose we'd sample where we'd like to sample from a PDFF. Again, we don't know what it is. Suppose we know how to sample from a PDFG though. So we can compute some new random variable G, okay? Typically, G is taken to be uniform. So let E, don't worry about the dot. It's just a way to say it's a function. Um, denote an envelope. So it's a function that completely captures, that, that goes all the way over F, okay? We know that we have a formula for F, we just can't sample from it. That's the whole point. Does that make sense? We, we know what the actual curve is, we just can't draw random cases from it. Oh, I can't. But that's the whole point of this, because oh. it's a non-common distribution. So you, you could compute an R? No, because there is no default. Let's say it's not a big. Uh, it's a something that has a shape that we don't have. That's that's really the utility of this. So, so we have a function um, e that completely covers the f function such that it's g of x divided by alpha. Okay. So let's try to draw some pictures. So let's say we have some PDF and it's a non-common PDF. Let's say it looks like that. Okay? So we don't have like it's not like a normal, it's not a gamma, it's not a beta, okay? This is A to B. Well, what we can do is we can sample from from a uniform. It doesn't have to be uniform. Let's just say this is G. So this represents of x. So we can take random draws from g. Now the problem is g is not above f, right? So what we want to do, so again, this is f, f of x, this is g of x, is we want to shift g up to be as close as possible to f. Let me make this so, and this is going to be the envelope. So this represents E of X. And how do we shift G up? Why not take G of X and divide by some value between 0 and 1? Because when you divide by a number between 0 and 1, it's going to get bigger. Okay? So there's some alpha value. Ideally, we actually wanted to touch that maximum. That would be the optimal. Which is true. I think if, if, if the DX is very high, because we just like the previous picture, we need to win, win amount of that to also to, to shoot the shape. Yes, but like, you know, if you have a function for f, you can find the maximum. That's, yeah. we have that capability, right? Uh, with this f. Yeah, or even, maybe it's a quadratic, just to yeah. make it your life easy. Does that make sense? So it's, but yes, gradient descent allows us to find the maximum, or, and then, or the negative of the, the minimum. Uh, or flipped upside down, and then then you can start taking random draws from G, and seeing which cases fall um, essentially under that F curve. And here's how it works: if you sample from G, so here's a random value from G. Let's say right. I'll pick a couple random values. This is this is one random case. Okay, so this is another random case right here. And then you evaluate f of that random draw divided by e of that random draw. Now, according to this picture, if this is y1, right, and this is y2, maybe I'll make it capital. It's, they're, they're lower cases realized, technically, I don't want to confuse. But this point on f, that's the height of f from plugging in y1, right? And this is the envelope of 
evaluated at y1. So we know the envelope is always going to be higher up than f. So what this means is that f divided by e has to be a number between 12, 0 and 1. Does that make sense? So, but here we know that f of y0, or my bet y2, versus e of y2. So if I pick this y value, it's much more likely to be coming from f than if I pick this y value. Does that make sense? But we're randomly picking g to be uniform, so if we're going to hit these all uniformly, but it's only going to extract values with higher density of f, the ones that are higher up or closer to, uh, to e. Okay? And the way we quantify that is we look, we pick a random uniform, and we see if u is less than f of y divided by e. Well, oh, okay. that means if, if the f is relatively larger, then f y over e y is also relatively larger. Yes. At yeah. least, does that mean everyone have a higher probability to accept the, the, the text values? I don't know that. Perfect. So if, if this is true, right, so we're, we're accepting y if this is true, which is equivalent to saying it's, it's likely to fall into the curve. And it's, like it's forcing it to come back to the target. Oh, is it just a strategy to you know, to extract the points, the the, the, the random draws below the curve? Yes, kind of strategy. Yes. yes. Okay, so let's. That's a like the fundamental question. What if you? Um, did not assume normality, or you did not assume gamma or some parametric form, but you have a histogram that looks like something that you don't recognize. What if you collect data and the histogram looks like this, but then it starts going up again, has some bimodal shape, right? And then maybe it, it, it picks up again over here, I don't know why, right? I mean, what on earth is this, this density function going to be, right? What if you want to simulate from this? What if you want to try to show, like, how this works through simulation? How would you do that? I don't know mathematically, but in my mind it makes sense to just pick points under the curve but that's the exactly, same way you're doing it here. That's exactly what we're doing. I mean, we're just, we're just writing an algorithm down to, that will do that for us. So what is U? U is, um, it's a uniform form. So typically we use the letter U to be over the unit interval. So why if U is less than F, what would you accept Y? So if you pick a random draw from U, so first of all you pick a random draw from, from G, right? Um, and then you evaluate and you look at essentially this divided, is divided by this, it's going to be uh, bigger than a random uniform. Then it's just going to, it's going to say that draw is more likely to come from F. Sure. Yeah. But it, it, mathematically, this doesn't seem like it's convincing you yet, but you can actually prove that exactly it's right. Every time. Yeah. Um, so alpha is the expected proportion of candidates that are accepted. If you're curious, uh, draws accepted are IID from the target distribution. So it actually does come from the target distribution. But if F is like halfway to the target. I know it seems counterintuitive. Um, in, in fact, <laughs> let me skip to this. You don't have to prove this, obviously. But if you want to try to prove this, you can do the conditional probability y less than or equal to y given u is less than or equal to this. And you work through it, and it ends up being the exact CDF of Y. So this is how you would prove that result. So you kind of have to take it on faith for the moment that it comes directly from the target distribution, but this is how you would do it. I think it's 
the point we sample from G is just because it's easy to sample from. Yes, yes. But and so what's the it's, you don't have to do a uniform for G. You could pick some other like you could pick a giant um, normal or something, right? But, but, uniform implies. but uniform seems reasonable because you can you can get it as close to the maximum as possible. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it'll be as efficient as Yes. Is this assuming that the function's above zero and also it's not like doing a weird up and down thing? Oh, like, okay, so that wouldn't be a P, like, like this? Yeah. Well, like that's that. not a function, then, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so it has to be a valid probability density function. Okay, so it has to be valid. Um, it has to be a PDF. And so it has to be continuous and it has to be valid PDF, otherwise it's, everything fails, so, yeah. Okay, so here's the, uh, the algorithm one more time. Sample from a, a G that you know, typically uniform, doesn't have to be uniform. Um, sample a U from a uniform no matter what. See if F evaluated at Y, that's really subtle. It's the PDF of F evaluated at the sample Y point divided by the envelope function evaluated at the same sample Y point. See if that is bigger than that uniform. If that's true, keep that value of y as being one from f. And then just do that until you um, have the number of samples you want. So you can't really use a, a for loop in this because you're not guaranteed to always sample the target distribution. You're, let's say you do a for loop one to a thousand, you might only get 500 or something. Does that make sense? So you do a while loop makes sense. So here's a, another picture. I mean, these are all classic pictures. I suppose so. the envelope function does not have to be uniform, but it's just something that covers the targets. So fit envelopes um, exceed the target everywhere. So obviously, you want that property. Easy. It could actually be uh, greater than or equal. If it was equal, there would be no need for it. Or need for it. Um, easy to sample from G and generate a few rejected draws. Okay. What is copied? Targets the one you want to sample from. That's it. Like goal. Okay. Um, determine the maximum of f and then use a uniform and set alpha to be 1 over the max. In fact, let me make sure this one is like this. It might be the reciprocal of that. Do you start with the standard uniform distribution in G? Like no, the other uh, no uh, it has to be the same support as f. This is going to be very misleading in the next example. That question, so students always get the question wrong because they start with a standard uniform. Yeah. Um, but in fact, let's, uh, let's look at this question. I'll revisit that potential typo. So here's a special beta distribution. Just let's just simulate from this beta for fun. Okay, even though we have the capability to simulate from a beta, it's just more illustrating the rejection um, acceptance rejection rejection algorithm. So the function 60x cubed minus x, right? So if you look at that, you know it crosses zero at zero and one. Does that make sense? And quickly, let's take the derivative of this thing. So it's a 60x cubed, 1 minus x squared. What's the derivative of that? <laughs> so uh, let's just use the, the product rule, foil this out, whatever you guys want to do. So that's 60, oh, so it's 60. Uh, so 180x squared, right? 1 minus x squared minus 60x cubed times 2. Oh, I was being, I was trying to be slick here because the inner function was like, um, 1 minus x. Did you do that right? Okay. So 
where does this thing equal zero? I don't know what we're solving. <laughs> Quadratic, right? We could do it, it's not that hard. It'll be solved. Anyway, in principle, take the derivative, put it to zero, see where those critical values are. Um, that way you get that envelope as close to this beta as possible. This beta, again, it's zero to one. It's gonna look, it's gonna have some shape like that. Whatever it is, okay? What do we think of the shape? Because the beta is typically look like that. Uh, I'd probably use that. Like I said, if you have beta x, it's gonna if I knew where x was zero, then I know where the optimal is, and I have a better, a better gauge. But so we can't invert f of x analytically. Um, when I say in f of x, I should say uh, capital F. Uh, I think kind of sloppy there. Um, so we're going to use the inverse transfer. We can't use the inverse transfer method. Um, we'll take g to be the uniform distribution over zero one. That's the same. Regarding the question earlier, notice a beta. What's the support of a beta? It's zero to one. So your, your G is gonna have the same support. That's misleading, okay? So maybe write a note down. Let G come from the same support as your target. What is support? Support is the possible range of X values from your probability density or mass function. So if beta goes over, the support is right here in the slides for that specific distribution. So G does the zero yeah, one, but, but it's it, because of support. Yes. Not Yes, but the U always goes zero to one. So that's why it's really confusing, because when people do this homework problem next week, they're gonna pick both to be zero to one when one of them shifts. Well, because, yeah, just bear with me. Yeah. Um, so we'll take G to be a uniform zero to one specifically because the original support is 0, 1. So we're, we'll start, in other words, with g of x being 1, because that's, that's the commonly known PDF, okay? So then let the f max equal just the maximum of the function over 0 to 1, and then we can form the envelope with alpha is 1 over the max, okay? What's that? So the envelope will just have max itself. That's, that's right. It. Yeah, it'll just be so you're gonna put a line on top. Line right yes. sitting on top. Does that make sense? That's the whole point. Okay. It's good I did the derivative reference. <laughs> Not losing my mind over here. Turns out that x is point six. So I was wrong in my picture a little bit. So betas are gonna look like a similar shape, but it's, it's not symmetric, it's slightly symmetric. Okay, so now the function f. Um, again, this isn't totally required, but it's just if you were sampling from a target distribution we want it to be defined in that window, that specific window um, that we defined earlier. So we let's look at this function itself really quickly. F max, you're just evaluating 0.6 and Does that make sense? So, okay. You can gloss over this. This is just a pretty simple picture. That's the picture I attempted to draw. Okay. So now what we want to do is actually apply the accept reject algorithm to this. And it makes a lot more sense to use a while loop. That way we can achieve a certain number of uh, sample values. Okay. So we take 1,000 samples. N samps is the number of samples desired, so that's going to be the, the end goal. Um, let's do a counter, that way we can uh, use this for quality control. So counter for number of samples accepted, okay. SAMPS is a numeric vector. You could have just 
made a repeated value of zeros and filled in the list, or you could have made a null list there. You had choices for, for stamps. The while loop, we're going to do this until the counter is less than the number of stamps. In other words, once we've achieved, you know, a thousand will stop. Does that make sense? So it makes, again, it makes more sense to do a while loop than a for loop because we can't specify the end goal when it's a random draw, right? Um, when you're using a for loop. So why we take one uniform happens to be the same support as the beta. So that, that's the part that confuses everybody. When you're doing the homework next week, I know this is next week, you're going to copy and paste this code from the slides with a different function f. And you're going to not simulate y from the standard uniform. Okay. This one is going to be from the standard uniform. Go through the process, keep the ones that satisfy the reject accept algorithm, and then uh, see what it looks like. Well, uh, there's the histogram coming from our accept reject algorithm. It's pretty cool, right? This is probably the most one of the most famous methods of simulating random variables. That's good to know. So you issue that both methods we should use today are just strategy to, to simulations for uncommon categories and so on. Absolutely. Yes. Those, those are the two main ones. They have all these variants on this method. Like obviously if you choose like a big triangle as a rule, it would do a better job than a uniform, right? So you can refine your envelope. As much as you want, but in this class, we'll just assume it's Yes? If the f of x has to be the same as the envelope for you to accept that value, how are you getting any values on that side? Well, okay, so we're saying if f divided by u, my bad, f divided by u, f of y divided by u of y is greater than u. So you're picking a u that's between 0 and 1, right? And then this value, this value is between 0 and 1, and this value is between 0 and 1. And the, well, they're not always guaranteed. U comes as a single draw from a uniform. So in 0 to 1? Yes. Let's say you pick point, point 0.2. Yes. But your f would only be like. Right. It's, it's, it's so it's just telling you to pick the baby. Never mind. Well, okay. So if let's say that let's say that f actually was really near the the maximum. What if you draw drew a value from g that was really close to the maximum? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Because like in other words, what if you picked a value? What if you randomly drew a value from g that happened to be near here? Then you're going to accept it because you're probably going to pick a uniform like right here. But what if you pick one way down the line, like point two? Right here. What if you just reject all of them? Like no, because right once in a while, because let's say you pick a bunch of these, right? Okay. Once in a while, you'll pick uniforms like that. Right? That makes sense. You're more likely to reject the value here, I agree, but than you are here. And that's basis of the algorithm. And you're very likely to accept the value here. You're less likely to accept the value here. That makes perfect sense because you're less likely to draw a random case here in the target distribution. So. So let's, oh boy, let's just keep going. Why not? Let's finish the set of slides, okay? Um, let's talk about Monte Carlo integration. This is a fascinating topic, and it's, uh, unfortunately, you have to kind of have a, a knowledge of integration to appreciate this, but. So what is, first of all, we're gonna deviate from what we were talking about before. We're gonna talk about the notion of an integral. So what is numerical integration? Um, it's finding the area under a curve. Does that make sense? 
So often we need to solve integrals, uh, but doing so can be hard. Um, even when we know the function f, finding a closed form antiderivative may be difficult or even impossible. Okay? So you know you take a lower level calculus course, you spend half of the course doing antiderivatives to realize that in practice there are no really everything's Okay, So it's kind of funny. Um, so in these cases, we'd like to find good ways to approximate the value of the integral. So such approximations are generally referred to as numerical integration. If you take like a numerical analysis course, you spend a couple of weeks on this stuff. Okay. So maybe you uh, recall this from Calc 2, maybe you don't. Um, there are many methods. Everybody should know the Riemann rule, I'm hoping. That's just rectangles under a curve. Okay. Then there's the trapezoid rule, there's Simpson's rule, Newton Coates uh, quadrature method, whatever that means. Okay. Point being, you can refine the notion of a Riemann integral to get better approximations on the area under the curve. But this becomes kind of a pain. Like, so what, what you're really doing, I don't want to spend too much time on the non Monte Carlo techniques, but if you have a function, Right? And you approximate it with rectangles. This is not a histogram. <laughs> Looks like the same picture I've been drawing, but this is not the same. This is a Riemann set, okay? Um, this is not going to do an amazing job at approximating the, the area because we're off in pieces. You see what I mean? But what you can do, like what a trapezoid rule does or a Simpsons rule does, is it actually it refines these to be like triangles. Say, you know what I mean? You'll have to look up the details, but it, it knows to. Uh, so then you can still do this geometrically, right? So it's going to add this area of this triangle plus this area, right? This area of this this triangle right here plus this area, you know, etc. So it interpolates polynomials, here, here, and then it, it you just refine that notion. Okay, that's what numerical integration. But it's a pain. So today we're going to study um, Monte Carlo integration. So it's a way to actually find area under a curve using random number simulation. And this is the basis of Monte Carlo integration. It's, does somebody know what this theorem is called? <laughs> somebody tell me, please. The law of motion. Thank you. Awesome. So there's two very important results. Right? Law of large numbers, central limit theorem. This is not a convergence in a distribution because this is not, this is a number. Does that make sense? So this is the law of large numbers. And what this means, by definition, if you go back to your intro to stats course, the, the expected value of a random variable is an integral. <laughs> Does that make sense? So if you can exploit the fact that the expected value is an integral, you can manipulate that expression. And numerically approximate the integral by simulating random draws and taking the average. That's it. That's powerful. Does that make sense? The sample mean the comma just oh something. Yes, exactly. The sample average of simulated values approximates the integral. Okay. So the Monte Carlo principle is to estimate um, the integral. Let's say just g of x, right? It's a, but we want to exploit the fact that it could maybe be written as something times, we need it to be times a density function, because otherwise it's going to work, right? But, so you want to estimate integral of g of x dx, draw from p, and take the sample mean of um, f of g of x divided by p of x. This might not be crystal clear. Here. So, we'll see how it's better than So to estimate g of x, you draw from p of x and again take the sample mean of f of x. So why is this going to work? Let's think about this for a minute. This is just a moment. Let's 
go back to the basic example, right? Let's let's say that uh, if I know one over n sum of x i converges in lot of large number sense, right? I'm being a little sloppy with what this arrow means, which is okay. Um, we could either say converges to probability or almost surely, but this converges to the expected value of x, right? Which is the integral of x. And then you have to have some kind of density function. Does that make sense? So I'll just write f of x for the moment. So this means 1 over n sum g of x converges to the expected value of g of x, right? which is the integral of g of lowercase x f of So 1 over n, where f of x Yes. So my bad. Maybe I should make this just to be consistent. I apologize for the confusion. I don't, I don't know why I used P. I forget why I used P. Running us. Let's make this. Let's make the PDF P, even though before it was F. Okay. So now we want to simulate by taking g of x i, right, over p of x i. So this converges to the expected value of g of capital X over p of capital X, right? But by definition of expectation, this is g of x divided by p of x times p of x. These cancel. That is the integral of g of x. That's what we want. Does that make sense? What is g of x? So g of x is our is our function that we actually want to integrate. But then we have to, then you ask what's p, p of x, we have to just exploit some Of x is the PDF, right? Yes, so you have to have a valid PDF. So what is g of x represent? So g of x represents um, the function that you, like this is the actual function that we want to find the area of. So this, back from calculus, this is the point. So the function we want to find the area of is g. Yeah. But then we need, we're crossing our fingers that, fingers that g has some form that we can actually exploit a common probability. So are G and P related, or is P the PDF of a different function? Well, it needs to be just about, it needs to just be a valid PDF. Any PDF. Any PDF. So I think the point is that, you know, make it easy to, you know, extract FX all of GX, that's the full point here, right? Right, like, I guess it's like, it's, it's confusing because you start with the function G, and then you have to figure out what P would work um, sometimes it just makes more sense in certain situations because the, the way you actually approximate the integral is by taking random IID draws from where, from what distribution? From P. Does that make sense? You have to know what P is because you're taking the whole randomness is governed by P. Does that make sense? So the random variables X are being governed by the, the PDF. And, but then you're evaluating the actual PDF at x. That's what's weird about it. It's the density function evaluated at x. So you take a bunch of random draws from p, you evaluate g of those random draws divided by p of those random draws, and you average that, and that approximates the PDF g. But it's so much faster than doing, I mean, think about how much quicker that is than doing a Riemann sum or um, Travis or Oh, so G is not related to probability at all, it's just no. a random function. No, but hopefully it's convenient, right? So if 
but you still, the whole basis is like, these X's come from a PDF. But you have to actually come from something common. And this is why the, the section on random simulation naturally comes before Monte Carlo integration, because the way you do Monte Carlo integration is by randomly simulating first. So what if your P was non-common, and you can use reject accept algorithm to actually simulate this random simulation? It all ties in. So let's see if we can figure this out. So what if we want to integrate x squared e to the negative x squared? Well, first of all, you should just know this from your intro to probability course, that that equals square root of pi over 2. It's for what? It's, it's, yeah, it's the Gaussian, right? It's the, just do a simple U substitution. Um, I should spit out. Does that make sense? Because remember the integral of, so what's, this, what's the second moment of the standard moment? It's equal to one, right? So that's just the second moment once you apply the appropriate substitution. You need that one half of the X term and then normalize it. Anyway, we know the truth. Try to prove that if you're confused. Okay. But now let's think about how to perform this exercise. So what we're going to do is we're going to take random draws from a normal distribution, right? And then evaluate out g of x, which is the function defined on the previous slide, which is x squared e to the negative x squared divided by p of x. Okay. Average that, and then we should get a number that's very close to Of, of the Say that one more time. I think just basically of the dependent on the yes. standard normal with respect to the x. Yeah, but you know, we know how to draw from the standard normal, right? You didn't have to draw from the standard normal, it just made sense. I guess. Does this make sense? Why the function g of x over g of x is the So, e to the negative x squared. I mean, this is you're just taking uh, x squared e to the negative x squared divided by one over square root of two pi e to the negative one over two pi squared. Right. I think that changed the, the generation to the uniform, like the probability is generated from. Uh, Uniform x. You, so you could change it to anything. Yes, yes. But um, I'm not. I, I forget the exact details of what would perform better. Do you know what I mean? But there, there might be an advantage of making a Gaussian with this shape. Anyway, so what we did instead of having to do that integral um, using a Riemann sum, we just randomly simulated values in this function g of x over p of x, and we got an answer that's very close to the best. Okay. A little bit more uh, by the central limit theorem. So this is not the law of large numbers, but this is the central limit theorem. It turns out that uh, the average of that result is the integral of g of x, d of x. We knew that before. And it has some kind of uh, variance associated with it. So this is pretty fascinating. So the Monte Carlo approximation is unbiased. That means, on average, you're going to hit the truth, okay? Um, in a statistical sense. The root mean square um, is proportional, that's what that alpha symbol is, to n to the negative 1 over 2. So if we just keep taking 
Monte Carlo draws, the error can get as small as you'd like, even if G is very complex. So imagine this really complicated function G, and you don't have to even think about how to split these up, right? You don't have to think it's just easy, okay? A couple other things. Um, how do you choose P in principle? Any P which is supported on the same set as G could be used for Monte Carlo, right? The same support. Um, in practice, we would like for P to be easy to simulate from, obviously. Um, have low variance, so that's to kind of support an earlier comment. So it generally improves efficiency to have the shape of P of X follow that of G of X. Okay? So if they kind of have a similar shape in the functions, that's going to improve things. It takes a simple form, so it is often worth looking carefully at the integrand to see if a probability density function can be factored out of it. And just a couple more. Um, we can, uh, I already did that example. <coughs> the point being, can you guys see that that's a valid probability density function, right? Because there's no, it's not squared in 2 pi because the variance is equal to what? 1 half. Does that make sense? So, anyway. That's the whole point of the previous slide, um, is that you can exploit the common PDF from that. And then I'm just kind of validating the other examples, just in a slightly different way. All right, so I don't want to confuse too much. Um, I think I'm going to let you guys go. So, yes, please. Uh, I just want to...